In the 12th century, the century of the axe, the population grows and civilizations challenge nature and refashion hostile environments. An age of ambitious building begins. In North America, native people make high-risk buildings rise from the desert. In Northern Europe, dense forests give way to a landscape of spires. A new sacred architecture soars to the sky. In the mountains of Ethiopia, visionary craftsmen gouge churches out of rock. In Italy, fast-growing cities create new ways of living together, new kinds of pride. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, ancestral ways survive almost unchanged in unchallenged environments. A thousand years of history, millennium. Las Vegas, a neon city in the desert. But the first big gamblers to transform the desert were already at work in this part of the world in the 12th century. The people who lived in the American Southwest 900 years ago built a civilization in the arid scrub. They prospered in this harsh climate. The canyon people imposed their own geometry on the landscape. These are the ruins of a complex of structures now known as Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon. There were more than 800 rooms. What were they for? Storehouse? Temple? Watchtower? We don't know. But what we do know from archaeology is that the canyon people started by thinking big. They planned their buildings in a semicircle, and they stuck to the plan for over 200 years. Stone walls were smothered in adobe. Floors of timber 
with willow matting were covered with baked clay and sand. Above ground was the realm of the sun. At its heart was the great Kiva. Built half above ground, half scooped out of the earth below. This was the largest of 32 sacred chambers. A ceremonial space for up to 600 people. A sanctuary in a divine underworld, it is still revered by native communities. The kiva still has a relationship. Essentially, its structure resembles the coming out and the emergence from the underworld to the, into, onto the present level. Once you came out of that hole, you came on the, to the fourth world. And the step ladder represents that emergence from the underground onto the surface. To sustain the building effort far from vital supplies, raw materials had to be carried here over great distances. Thousands of tall ponderosa pines were felled in the forests on the hills to the far west. They were transported for almost a hundred miles across the dry flatlands. These people had no wheels, no pack animals. Their only source of power, human muscle. Come on. The reach of the canyon people was displayed by the network of roads that scored their territory, radiating from its great central canyon, as if in imitation of the sun. Unlike most Indian tracks, these ran straight and wide, north-south. From the territory bounded by the road system came tribute and captives from enemy tribes. From beyond it came luxuries, from Mexico, copper bells and the feathers of scarlet macaws. From the coast of California, exotic ships. These imports were exchanged for the turquoise of the canyon people's own mountains, crafted today into fine jewelry. Reflections of sky, drops of blue, almost as precious here as water. The people crowded within the canyon needed quantities of food which could only be coaxed from the desert by irrigation. They cut channels shaped like waffles. Corn fed the manpower explosion of the 12th century. Corn was the god that people ate, seeds that stored the sun. But the sun also helped destroy the civilization built here. After a series of droughts, in the 12th century, the canyon region was abandoned, reconquered by nature. Although the buildings were deserted, the way of life survived. Today, other native peoples recall what started here. A lot of the practices of the old ones still exist today. There's planting and the ways of irrigating, the way we build our homes, 
the way we um, have our songs and our ceremonies, and we will always carry them on into the new millennium for our children and our grandchildren to enjoy as well as we have. The Canyon people were isolated, but not unique. All over the world, in the 12th century, civilizations challenged their environments and developed new ways of living together. Nine hundred years ago, northern France, like most of Europe, was covered by forest. Trees dominated the land and the mind. But in the 12th century, monks built monasteries, as here at Fontenay. Abbeys like this used timbers for their roofs before encasing them in stone to make them last. This is Vézelay in Burgundy. Like other 12th century churches, it had become too small for the increasing number of pilgrims that now crowded through it. Vézelay was rebuilt and enlarged. These light spaces mocked the darkness of the forest outside. As other churches were rebuilt, a new style of architecture emerged, now called Gothic. This is Saint-Denis, near Paris, where Abbot Suget was so proud of his rebuild that he included his own image at the feet of Christ. Une fois réunies les deux extrémités, l'église étincelle en son vaisseau médian. The heart of the sanctuary glows in splendor, radiates in splendor, and the magnificent work shines with a new light. It is I, Suje, who have enlarged this structure. It was done under my direction. Suje's inspiration was mystical a vision of heaven full of the color of jewels that gleamed through the dark night. On the site of the old abbey, he planned his new structure. It had slender stone columns, huge windows, a mighty roof. the eye would be drawn upwards to heaven. In 1136, Suget's team of craftsmen began work. But Suget soon faced a problem, where to find the beams he needed to support a roof as large as he'd imagined. His carpenters feared that no trees tall enough were left in the shrinking forests. Suget recorded what happened. I got up early 
set aside all my other work, took the measurements of the beams we needed, and set off for the forest of Yveline. En traversant notre terre de la vallée de Chevreuse, je fis appeler nos sergents et tous ceux qui sont way, en forêt. We stopped at the valley of Chevreuse to summon the keepers of our own forests and the best local woodsmen. We questioned them under oath. Could we find any timbers of the size we needed? They smiled and would have laughed if they dared. Nothing of that sort can be found in the entire region. Nevertheless, we began to search through the woods with the courage of our faith. Early in the afternoon, we found a tree big enough for the first beam. Twelve great trees were found in Eveline, enough to confound the skeptics, enough to bedream. They were carried to the sacred basilica, and we placed them with exaltation over the new roof space to the glory of our Lord Jesus. It was the beginning of a new style of architecture. Suger's church was a casket of light, reflecting heaven, gleaming with color to inspire man with God's presence and glory. Suger coated the church with gold and precious jewels and built 20 new altars. He spent a fortune from the royal treasury on gold crosses and exotic luxuries. Nous croyons que les ornements et les calices sacrés doivent faire partie I believe that outward ornaments and sacred chalices should serve nowhere so much as in our worship with all inward purity and outward nobility. Suger's rival, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, spoke against such extravagance. Oh, vanité des vanités. Vanity of vanities, but more folly than vanity. Every part of the church shines, but the poor man is hungry. The church walls are clothed in gold, while the children of the church remain naked. Tell me then, poor monks, if indeed you are poor, what is gold doing in the holy place? But when Suger's vision was completed, even his critics were driven to match his efforts and share his reverence. In June 1144, his altars were consecrated before the king and clergy of France. Dazzled by the splendor, they returned to their homes inspired to rebuild their own churches in the style of Saint-Denis. Masterpiece was the Cathedral of Chartres. The broadest and tallest church that Western Christendom had ever seen. The ideas that rebuilt Saint Denis were magnified at Chartres. Throughout Europe, cathedrals multiplied. Each year, for the next 150 years, a new Gothic cathedral would be completed.
While churches rose to the sky in Europe, in 12th century Africa, they were being carved out of the ground. These Christian pilgrims in Ethiopia are on their way to worship at one of them. In these highlands, in the 12th century, Lalibela, a new king from a new dynasty, built a new holy capital. Today, Lalibela's legacy lives on. In the physical splendor of the churches and the traditions, of their guardian priests. My blessed people and congregation, churches with no mud, no wood, and no cement. You cannot find anything like this in the rest of the world. You are all blessed because you are here. This place was built by God. Every year on St. George's Day, Pilgrims gather to celebrate a faith that has endured here for 16 centuries. These Christians claimed that God brought the Ark of the Covenant and the Tablets of the Ten Commandments to their land. On holy days today, priests carry on their heads replicas of the tablets wrapped in gilded cloth. The people of Ethiopia have been carving churches out of mountains for more than a thousand years. But the 11 churches of Lalibela symbolize their achievement to the outside world. King has become a legend, his story told by monks even today. There was a city called Roha, where lived a man who belonged to one of the most noble of families, one of the richest in gold, silver, garments, precious stones, servants and maids. He had a child who became the mysteriously named Lalibela. In the legend, the king's greatness was recognized at birth. A swarm of bees descended on his cot as if around honey. His mother named him Lalibela, which means the bee has recognized him as king. But these were not bodily bees, but angels who took bee form in order to announce his reign. God sent one of his angels to bring Lalibela to heaven to show him the most holy of churches. Lalibela the story goes, ordered tools to be made to carve temples like those he'd seen in heaven. His craftsmen turned the wild mountainside into a new Jerusalem.
The work took 24 years. To carve out the inside, the masons first had to tunnel into the structure through what would become an upper window. Interiors, and thus he ended the construction of the churches, reproducing everything he had seen from the seventh heaven. All carved without wood for the windows, nor mortar for the stones, all made from a living rock. Though not the grandest buildings of their time, these churches were unique in their construction. They embody an ideal typical of the century, to remodel nature to match a vision. But while priests tell of Lalibela's spirituality, he had a more practical purpose, a political program, to proclaim his legitimacy as the heir of Solomon. For Lalibela belonged to a dynasty that had seized the throne. The churches were propaganda, a political move to legitimize his rule. With an army 60,000 strong, Lalibela launched campaigns to extend his rule. His Christian empire filled the highlands, grew rich on trade with the Red Sea, raised churches on the highest hilltops, and kept the surrounding Muslims at bay. Lalibela set out to build a religious state, a spiritual center that would rival Jerusalem. His holy books put new words into the mouth of Christ himself. I blessed this place, and from now onwards let it be a holy place, as Mount Tabor, or as Golgotha, the place of my crucifixion, or as Jerusalem. If man undertakes pilgrimage to it, it is equal as if he went to my tomb in Jerusalem. And if somebody receives my flesh and blood in those churches, he will be redeemed of all his sins. Today, Lalibela is revered as a saint. His shrine attracts a continuous flow of pilgrims. They come to kiss the staff he held in life when, in the 12th century, he and his followers carved these churches from the rock of the African landscape. Cities, wherever they were in the world in the 12th century, they grew in power, population, and prosperity. The city drew people in from the countryside, cramming them together and changing their lives. Siena in northern Italy a city proud of its Roman past. Here, 12th century citizens shared a state of mind, civic. 
A spirit of citizenship was forged out of feuds and rivalries by competitive rituals like this one, reenacted twice a year. The Palio is a bareback horse race round the main piazza, where knights were trained to fight the city's wars. The teams represent the 17 districts of the city, the Contrade. Their training had a practical, socially purpose. The Palio preserves their spirit, channeling feuds, managing conflict. Northern Italy in the 12th century was an arena of rival cities each claiming saints and heroes, and competing with the others for prestige. The university here is the best in the whole of Italy. Our water supply is the purest in the region. The beauty of our women is superior. Wars make a city, said Isidore of Seville. But a civic community is built of people, not of stones. <laughs> Cities created citizens. In all our most populous cities, we see a crowd of people who have left their homes of their own free will. But a man takes his virtues with him wherever he goes. This is San Gimignano, 30 miles from Siena. It's fondly called the medieval Manhattan. These towers were raised for defense and defiance. Now only 17 remain. Once there were 73. San Gimignano is exceptional today, but then all successful cities like Siena grew in the same way, upwards. Siena saw itself as an ideal city, a place with battlements, boulevards, and a bourgeoisie. The 12th century expansion of cities rocked the balance of power. When citizens gave themselves rights, elected consuls and declared independence, emperors and overlords were horrified. Cities across Europe declared themselves republics. The Pope was thrown out of Rome twice, and in 1156, Siena threw out the Emperor Barbarossa. The great landowners, if they wanted to become citizens, now had to promise to obey the law. We swear on the Holy Gospels that henceforth we shall be Sienese citizens and shall preserve and protect every person of the city of Siena and of its suburbs. And we promise to reside within the walls for three continuous months in time of peace, as well as time of war.
the hallmarks of Siena's statehood, self-belief and the solidarity of the citizens were typical of the 12th century city. They had populations more densely clustered than the world had seen for centuries. Twelfth century citizens took pride in their triumph over nature. The republics they founded have long vanished, but their spirit lives on in traditions like the Palio, where men and women still express the civic pride that was born in the 12th century. In Australia, Isolated from the rest of the world, cultures flourished which had long chosen not to build. For these nomadic people, every landmark was endowed with sacred significance. Aborigines didn't construct monuments like cities, tombs and churches. The land was their cathedral, their wanderings a pilgrimage. Every aspect of life was imbued with ceremony and ritual. The Aborigines of the Central Desert used ochre and natural fibers to create intricate ground paintings. They combined them with music to retrace the journeys of their ancestors in the dream time. The dream time is a creation story, the legendary dawn of time when supernatural creatures sang the world into being. The land was molded by rainbow serpents, giant lizards and lightning men. Valleys formed where they slept, billabongs where they drank, and great canyons where they fought. At the beginning of the dream time, Waramagunji came out of the sea. She created the land and gave birth to the people. Ginga, the giant crocodile, made the rock country. Marawuti, the sea eagle, brought water lilies in his claws and planted them on the floodplain. They put themselves into the landscape where they remain to this day. Ochre for body painting was traded across the continent. There were more than 500 tribes speaking different languages. Their laws, knowledge, and rights to territory were communicated through dance and song. Their universal language was art. For centuries, paintings were made to be overlaid by others in galleries of rock. They tell the Dreamtime stories, signpost food sources, demarcate territory, add to memory. I talk to you from my country. Our people have been around this place a very long time. The Aborigines left their mark on the land in subtle ways. They believed in cooperating with nature. They chose not to cultivate, but systematically, they gathered the foods the land offered up. Yeah. 
Their diet was supplemented with wild lizards, insects and kangaroos. The native animals of Australia were not suited to being domesticated by man. A knowledge of the environment was vital to a culture that did not farm. Aboriginal peoples developed their own methods of controlling food production. Fire was at the core of their technology, as central to the life of the Aborigines as the motor engine is to the modern world. By careful burning, they could modify the wilderness. Fire turned forest into open country and encouraged regrowth, which attracted game. It made tracking easier and halted the devastation of wildfire. The Aborigines survived by demanding little from nature. Moving about the countryside in small nomadic groups, they believed the earth would provide for them so long as they looked after the earth. Sedentary cultures elsewhere were tearing down nature to build. In Australia, they used living trees for shelter. Civilizations are usually judged by the monuments they leave behind, but the Aborigines weren't interested in that kind of immortality. Even their paintings were daubed in the sand to be swept away without trace. But they and their culture survived in isolation. In the next century, on the other side of the world, another nomadic people would emerge from their isolation and create the biggest land empire the world had seen.